Thank you to the Geneva Summit for Human Rights and Democracy for this award. I'm so honored and privileged to be recognized today and to stand among so many incredible people working on the protection of human rights and democracy. I grew up in the northwestern Pakistan, a place where most girls will never go to college, where many adult women cannot read. So you can imagine how confused the elders were when my sister and I started a human rights organization in 2002 while we were still teenagers. One time in our early 20s, we were standing at the podium on stage, getting ready for our conference on International Women's Day. More than once, someone came up to ask, who is the organizer? We would say, we are the organizer. Uh, they were like, uh, no, no, we mean who are the real, real organizers? And we would say, oh, you mean men? And they would say, yes, yes. And we were like, nope, it's just us. Luckily, in the last few years, things have started to change for women. And it's more common to see women organizing and leading the movements, sometimes at a huge personal cost. I am one of six kids, four girls and two boys. My mother was an entrepreneur. Though no one in our village called her that, she was the only woman who knew how to embroider by machine. So growing up, women from all over the village would come to her house and she would embroider whatever they needed. Dresses, tablecloths, linens. And as she sewed, they would share their stories. Their stories of being beaten and abused by their husbands or their in-laws. If they stayed silent, they were considered good women. If they fought back or left their husbands, they were called home wreckers. Even as a young girl, I found this disturbing. And then it happened to my cousin. She was 15 years old and dreamt of being a pilot. But suddenly, her parents pulled her out of school and married her to a man twice her age. My sister Saba and I were furious. We talked about it nonstop. We complained to her parents and even tried to convince hers, but it was too late. At that time, my father subscribed to a monthly human rights newsletter for us. We read each issue and talked about it with other girls at school. We thought if girls just knew about their rights, the problem would be fixed. And that's why we started Aware Girls at the age of 16 and 15 to make other girls aware of their rights. As the organization grew, we realized it was not just a problem of awareness, but systems that reinforces inequality. And so we became political organizers. In the early days, being underestimated was an advantage. Our organization could take roots and grow without being shut down. The men and the elders would shrug it off and say, oh, they are girls, let them do what they're doing. They're naive, nothing will change. They were wrong. We trained thousands of women and girls in Pakistan to become active citizens and political leaders. We organized the first ever young women-led election monitoring in 2013. My sister and I were featured on Foreign Policy Magazine's list of 100 leading global thinkers, the same year as Malala, and that's when they could not ignore us anymore. In 2014, my dad was supposed to pick me up at the airport on my way back from a conference in Belgium Picking me from the airport was our family tradition. He would meet me inside, help me with my luggage, and cheerfully ask me everything about it. How was your conference? Who did you meet? How was the food? How much money did you spend? He would always give me some money just in case. But this time, he just called and said, I'm outside. I thought that's weird. What's wrong with my dad? Why isn't he talking? When we got home and my mother answered the door, her face was colorless. I asked, what's wrong? She said, your father didn't tell you what happened? I said, no. And she went on to explain that just a few hours before, a group of men showed up at our house, banging on the door, when my father didn't open it. They said if we didn't stop our human rights work, there would be consequences. 
and then they started shooting. There were bullet holes all over the front of her house. My poor sisters were traumatized. And within 24 hours, we left our house forever and relocated to Islamabad. It was one of the worst days of my life. But it was also the day I realized that our work was making a difference. So we worked even harder. We launched Youth Peace Network to prevent violent extremism. We prevent more than 10,000 young people from joining militant organizations. We train thousands of young women in political leadership skills, and 10 of them got elected in local elections. As our impact grew, so did the threats. Social media made it easy to spread lies about me online. I was accused of blasphemy, which carries a life sentence in Pakistan, and was put at the risk of mob lynching. My life was at risk, but I refused to leave the country because I knew I had to set a precedent for other women. So I went to court and I fought back. The same year, Pashtun Thafas movement or the Pashtun Spring emerged against the war economy, enforced disappearances and extrajudicial killings. As a leader of the movement, I started speaking about the sexual violence in conflict zones of Pakistan. And that's when the authorities doubled down on their persecution of me. I was repeatedly arrested on false charges. My name was placed on a state kill list. Our home was raided again and again and again. I knew I had to leave the country to save my life. But then I was on exit control list. My passport was taken. They put my, the pictures of my face at every border crossing. I went into hiding, got rid of my cell phone, and moved to a different house every few nights to be safe for months. Meanwhile, my family and friends were arrested, detained, electrocuted, and tortured just for information about me. This is when I realized how few support systems exist for human rights defenders. There was nowhere in my country that I could go to be safe. A few international organizations offered me some money, but what I actually needed was protection, security, and a safe way out. The only reason I survived this long and the only reason I can continue doing this work is because of my family and friends. When I was in hiding, my sister fought for my life until I made it safely to the U.S. after four months of hiding. When my father was in prison, I fought for his life. My family has never once made me feel bad about this work, even though it has put them in jeopardy again and again. We are in this together as a family, and that's the reason I will never quit. But not everyone is so lucky as I. As an international community, we must protect human rights defenders from their own governments. We must become the family they need so that they can do the work to keep their people safe. Thank you.